Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. I'm coming to you on a cloudy, cool and somewhat damp Wednesday afternoon here at Hinokicho Park next to Tokyo Midtown. It's a comfortable day to be outside but it looks like the rain is starting to come in and they've kind of promised a forecast of rain for the next couple of days. Uh, generally the forecasts are not very accurate. If it says it's going to rain tomorrow, I kind of figure there's a 50-50 chance it's going to rain tomorrow. So uh, they said more than 50% chance, but then well, we'll just wait and see what happens. Anyway, uh, today's video is going to be about one of the most popular of vintage Japanese cameras, and that is the Canon AE-1. So uh, I sell vintage Japanese cameras at my online store, japanvintagecamera.com, as well as my Etsy and eBay stores. So if you're interested in buying a vintage Japanese camera, uh, please visit one of my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. So getting back to the Canon AE-1, the Canon AE-1 is notable as being one of the most popular 35mm SLR cameras of all time. Canon introduced this camera in the mid-1970s and the AE-1 denotes uh, Automatic Exposure 1. So uh, the AE-1 featured an automatic exposure system. This camera was meant to uh, compete by underselling Nikon's cameras. Uh, I guess the FT, FTN and the soon to be released FE and FM series. The, the Canon AE-1 was a little bit less expensive than these other cameras and offered Canon's shutter priority automatic operation, which Canon thought was superior to the aperture priority systems which were found in the Nikon cameras. And arguably the shutter priority system uh, is very good and possibly better than, than the aperture priority system in other cameras uh, because it allows you to choose the minimum shutter speed you think you can get away with without having any camera shake which results in blurs in your photos. Uh, most automatic exposure cameras were aperture priority mainly because it was kind of a simpler system to, uh, op to I guess I guess manufacturer for other makers. But the problem with the aperture priority system is that if you are stopping down the lens to get increased depth of field, if it's not a bright day or today like today, this can end up or cause very long exposure times. And it's quite difficult to hold the camera very steady for a long period of time. So as the aperture becomes smaller and you have less, I guess, light, the exposures get longer and it becomes more difficult to take an image that doesn't have any blur on it. Uh, Canon's system, you can simply set uh, the minimum speed that you feel comfortable with, uh, say on a day like today, maybe 1 60th of a second or 1 30th of a second if, I, if I'm very careful, and the camera will choose the best uh, aperture for that particular situation or shutter speed. So it's quite a good system. I'll go ahead and describe the features and functions and how to use the Canon AE-1. We'll go ahead and start at the top here, and of course here we have the uh, film rewind knob, which doubles as the switch which opens the film door. And it has a lever which pops out, which gives you a little bit of extra leverage for rewinding the film. Next to that we have the battery check lamp. On the top of the prism we have the hot shoe for strobe flash. There are a couple of extra contacts on the back for using Canon's old dedicated flashes. And if you have one of these old flashes, you can do uh, or use automatic flash control with the AE-1. If you have a later model strobe flash, just follow the instructions on your flash. If you're trying to use a very old flash gun with bulbs, uh, you can simply uh, plug it into the uh, PC sync socket here on the front of the camera. On the other side of the prism, we have the shutter release button. And this is what Canon called a two-stage shutter release button. If you push the button down a little bit, that activates the light meter. And as you look through the viewfinder and press down the shutter button partially, you can see what aperture the camera is going to select. And if the aperture is too large or too small, you can change the aperture setting by simply changing the shutter speed using the shutter speed dial here. And of course, to take the photo, you just depress the shutter button fully. Around the shutter button we have a kind of a three-way switch. If you switch it in the middle and everything is lined up, the camera is ready to operate. If you pull the switch backward and the white line aligns with the uh, red L 
that locks the shutter button and prevents you from accidentally tripping the shutter. If you push the lever all the way forward to where it's pointing forward, that activates the self timer and when you depress the shutter, this red LED will flash letting you know that the uh, self timer is working. Below that we have the film counter and next to that we have the film winding and shutter charging lever and as I mentioned before we have the shutter speed dial. Integrated into the shutter speed dial is the film speed dial and to change the film speed you simply lift up on the ring and turn it one way or another until the green number in the window matches the film that you have loaded into the camera. On the front of the camera, on the bottom here, we have this lever which pushes in and out. Uh, this is the depth of field preview button. And what happens is if you push this button in, you can take a look through the viewfinder and you can see how much depth of field you are going to have on your image. Above that, we have a exposure preview button. So if you push this button, uh, it, it will tell you what the exposure is going to be without having to push down the button on the top. And you can also use this together with the uh, stop down lever. If you push this in and touch this button, this will give you an idea of what uh, the aperture setting is going to be or the exposure is going to be when you take when you shoot your photo. Above that we have a little uh, button which is kind of, a, I guess, the backlight actuator for the display inside the viewfinder. Moving over to the other side here, we have the uh, I guess uh, film, I guess battery chamber door, excuse me. And as you can see, I have a 4LR44 battery loaded in here. It's an easy to find battery. You can get them in most photo shops, camera stores, or on Amazon. You can also use a 4SR44 battery. The 4LR44 is an alkaline battery. The SR44 or 4SR44 is a silver oxide battery. The silver oxide battery tends to give you a little bit longer life and more consistent performance. The alkaline batteries, as they go dead, the voltage decreases gradually and gradually supplies less energy to the camera. In the AE1, uh, the meter and such will still work accurately, so long as there's at least a fair amount of voltage going through it. But I prefer to use a SR44, or 4SR44 battery uh, when I can get one. Moving to the bottom of the camera, it's pretty simple down here. We have an uh, access cover, uh, which is you can remove with a coin. And by removing this, you can attach a power winder to the bottom of the camera. There is a standard 3 8 inch tripod socket here. And on this side, we have the contacts for the power winder. And here we have the release button, which releases the winding mechanism and allows you to rewind the film. On the back of the camera, we have this uh, I guess act door here or window where you can put the uh, film box card in to let you know what kind of film you have loaded inside. And of course here we have the uh, viewfinder window and it's slotted on either side. Canon made diopter adapters which you could slide down on the top of these for vision correction so you didn't have to wear your glasses when shooting the camera. And they also had a cover which covered the back of the viewfinder for using the camera on a tripod so to prevent any light from getting inside and affecting the meter readings. Canon also produced data backs for the AE series cameras, so you can remove the back and exchange it with a data back, and these do things like imprint the date and time in your photos. Uh, to operate the camera, as it's an automatic exposure camera, uh, if you're using an FD lens, which is uh, what they recommend on these cameras, and I think what is required on them, you would push the aperture ring until the A lines up on the mark, and then simply uh, set the shutter speed to the minimum speed you want to uh, use the camera and operate the camera and the camera will automatically select the best aperture setting for the photo. So quite a simple uh, system. You can also use full manual operation with the camera simply by uh, taking it away from the A and selecting your apertures manually. And if you are kind of uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out the exposure you're going to get or what the camera recommends, you can of course use the preview button on the side and stop down the camera and that will give that, that will let you see what is selected. You can do exposure compensation by adjusting the film speed one way or the other or uh, simply by uh, taking it off the automatic setting. So say example, uh, the camera recommends an aperture of f5.6, you can move it one, two or three or you know, stops one way or the other. Uh, to get the effect that you want. And uh, 
This particular lens, this is a 35 millimeter to 70 millimeter zoom lens, a very compact one, which I kind of like. And it has kind of, it moves in fractions of a stop, not exactly a full stop, but in half stops. So you can kind of fine tune your aperture setting. Uh, I kind of like these lenses. These are incredibly inexpensive lenses, these 35 millimeter to 70 millimeter uh, zoom lenses, but they're about the same size as a 35 millimeter F2 prime lens. There's a kind of a, I don't know, a thing uh, with a lot of photographers where they prefer prime lenses uh, with, that have a fixed focal length over uh, zoom lenses because people uh, assume that added complication of a zoom lens kind of has a negative effect on image quality. And technically this is true, uh, provided that uh, say you're using a tripod with both lenses. But someone who holds the camera steady with a zoom lens is going to get a much better photo than someone who holds the camera kind of clumsily with a prime lens. Uh, this particular lens I kind of like because it offers you the wide-angle 35mm setting, the standard 50mm setting, and a very like a short telephoto 70mm setting. Uh, if you are new to photography, one thing you'll probably find out or that you should know is that when you're shooting at wide angles and you are shooting at things like people, that as you begin to uh, uh, use a wider angle, it kind of distorts the image a little bit, particularly when you get close to a subject. So if I'm taking a, a, a photo of someone's face and I'm not so far away with it at 35 millimeter, it's going to make their nose look big and then their ears look small. Things which are closer to the lens become much bigger and things which are farther away from the lens become much smaller. So wide angle lenses are not really good for taking portraits or things like that. The 50 millimeter setting is better. But if you like to take photos of uh, people's faces, the 70 millimeter uh, setting would be the best of all. Uh, you can't get especially close at the 70 millimeter uh, setting, but w you can get a good portrait distance away and this will give you a very good you know, photo of someone's face. Uh, that's pretty much all there is uh, to the Canon AE-1. It's not a complicated or uh, a difficult camera to use. You can find manuals from these cameras on the internet. There are a couple which sites which I like. You can usually find them just by doing a search on Canon AE-1 manual. I'll be posting more cameras for sale in my stores pretty soon and hopefully some uh, Canon AE ones. Uh, things to watch out for with these cameras. Uh, number one is the shutter squeak issue. Uh, these cameras uh, have a uh, mirror which moves. It's called a single lens reflex camera and the reflex part is uh, from the reflection uh, coming off a mirror. The mirror moves up and down as the shutter fires. And to prevent the mirror from, uh, I guess, moving too quickly or slapping up and down, a kind of shock absorber is added to it. And in the case of the one used in the Canon AE series, it tends to uh, have lubricant problems. The lubricant used in it dries up and causes it to squeak. It doesn't really cause any uh, uh, problem with the performance in the camera unless it's gotten so bad that the mirror begins to stick. But cameras which have this issue are, uh, uh, I don't know, they don't sell for as much as cameras which do not have the shutter squeak problem. It's not an especially difficult problem to fix. There are uh, guides on the internet showing how to do it. Another problem with these cameras, the earlier AE series, is that they do not feature interchangeable focusing screens. And these cameras tend to pick up uh, dust and haze between the focusing screen and the prism. Uh, the clamp which holds down the prism uses this foam rubber as kind of a, a damper to prevent it from squeezing too hard against the glass. But this foam rubber dries and deteriorates and the dust gets under the prism between it and the focusing screen. And cleaning this out is quite difficult. You have to remove the upper circuit board and flexible nonsense to it and you have to unsolder it. So uh, if it has too much of this stuff, uh, I wouldn't bother with the camera because it, it, it would probably cost more to I clean it out than it does to actually uh, buy one of these cameras. So if you're looking for one of these cameras, make sure that the prism and viewfinder is clear and that the shutter doesn't squeak or doesn't squeak very much. Uh, these cameras often require to have the, require that the light seals be replaced if you have an old one, and this one is no exception, uh, kind of dry rotted here, the light seals. Uh, that's not very difficult to uh, fix. I have a video showing how to replace those. Installing the film in one of these cameras is quite easy. Uh, simply pop open the film door, drop your film cartridge here, push down 
uh, the film winding knob so it locks the cartridge in here. That way when you pull the film meter out the cartridge doesn't fall out. Stretch the film across the film chamber and feed it into the slots here in the take-up spool. Then wind the shutter and fire the shutter button until the film is pulled all the way across and the teeth are engaging the film on both sides. There are holes on the top and bottom. You want to make sure that they're engaged. You close the film door and Canon recommends you pop this open like so and then wind the film and fire the shutter until the number one shows up. And while you're doing that, uh, this should move in this direction, showing that the film is being taken out of the film uh, canister. Uh, I've said it before in previous videos, I have more than one time made a mistake when loading film into the camera and taken a lot of photos only to find that the film wasn't widening. It's really quite annoying when that happens. Anyway, uh, that's it for my video. The rain is starting to come down a little bit harder here, so I'm going to uh, run away and go somewhere dry. As I said, if you're interested in purchasing a vintage Japanese camera, please check out my stores. The links are in the description below the video. Uh, if you want to see more videos about vintage Japanese cameras and photography in Japan, please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.